Thank you, Pastor. You know, Pastor Louie kicked my butt earlier today. He convinced me, I don't know why I listened to him, but he convinced me to go do CrossFit with him. And the, here's the kicker, he wasn't even doing it. He was coaching, so he was just yelling at everybody, telling them what to do, and I'm over there dying, sweating. Oh my goodness, so I'm a little sore tonight, but we're going to have a good time. I'm excited to be here with you guys. I love, I love our CNC family. I love how we have church going on all over Northeast Ohio on Wednesdays and Sundays, and man, it's a really incredible privilege to be a part of it. Um, I'm excited about this message, so I'm going to preach to you a message tonight titled, Out of Line. Can you say that with me? Out of line. You know, I have a five-year-old daughter, and she loves to color. She's actually becoming quite the artist. Does anybody have any kids who are are just artistic? Yeah, she's she's becoming very, very good at coloring and drawing. And one of the things that we have for all of our kids is these, like, coloring books. And you know how they look. They have the outline figure, and you, you know, go in there and color. And oftentimes what I noticed about Riley is that the lines and the figure on the page isn't enough for her. A lot of times she'll show me drawings that, yeah, the, the, the color, the picture looks amazing, but she's drawn other pictures outside of the lines, and she's gone and let her imagination take control, and there's all sorts of stuff all over the place. And, and a lot of times it's really cool because you can see her creativity at work. It, it goes beyond just like the fabricated formula that's handed to her, but she's, a, she's able to step out of line and create something beautiful. I think a lot of times what happens, especially in, in church, in our Christian life, is we're handed formulas for our faith. We're, set, we're told if you pray a certain way, then God will answer your prayers. If you come to church, you have to worship a certain way. You know, you, you have three worship moves. You either do the low hand open move, you do the high worship move, or like somewhere in the middle, you know. But I remember years ago, there was a guy that came to church here, and he would do cartwheels around the sanctuary, Like, he was out of line. (laughs) No one taught him to worship that way, right? But in church, a lot of times we're handed these, like, these ways that things are done, right? This is how you read your Bible. This is what you need to do here. This is how you pray. This is how you worship. These are the things that you need to do in line. But how many know that oftentimes in our faith, it requires us, our life requires us to step out of line sometimes? That you can't always pray the same prayers that you've always prayed. You can't always worship the same way that you've always worshipped. At some point, at some time in your life, your faith has to become your own, and you have to express your faith to God unlike anyone else around you. You know, there's, has anybody wondered why we don't see more of the life of Jesus before he turned 30? You know, we see little glimpses of his, you know, 12-year-old life, and then even when he's born, but, but we don't really get to know what Jesus was like before he was 30 years old. We don't, we don't really get to see how he prepared for ministry. We don't get to see him studying the scriptures. We don't get to see his prayer life. We don't get to see what Jesus was doing in order to step into the ministry that he had for three years when he turned 30. You know, one of my professors told me this, and I think this is a really good insight. He said that he believes that the Bible doesn't reveal the life of Jesus before he was 30 because if it did, what we would do as Christians, as humans, is we would make formulas and equations out of what Jesus did expecting that when we jump through the same hoops Jesus jumped through, we would have the same thing Jesus had. Because it's easy for us to do, think that way, to, to act that way, right? Like, don't, don't tell me how to wrestle with my faith. Don't tell me that I need to, like, pursue God on my own. Just tell me the words to say and I'll say them. Just give me the scripture verses to read. I'll read them. I don't have time to think. I don't have time to go out on my own. I just need to be told what to do. Life's easy that way. But how many know that's not how our faith is set up? It's not how it works. It's not an equation. It's not a formula. It's a relationship that you and I get to have with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And so what I want to talk to us about tonight, the idea for the message is this, that there are no boundaries to faith. There are no boundaries to faith. Sometimes God will take you beyond the lines. No boundaries to your faith. Get your faith out of that box that it's been stuck in for 20 years and understand that you can pray different kind of prayers. You can expect different things from God, that you can go outside of just even the way you've worshipped, you know? Like, like I want to challenge you. This Sunday when we come here, worship differently. Do something different. 
If this is all like your go-to worship thing, maybe come to the altar and worship, or maybe take a lap around the church, or whatever you want to do, right? But express your praise and your honor and your thanksgiving to God differently. Why? Because you don't have to stay in the lines. It's not required of you. There are no boundaries to your faith, and sometimes God will take you beyond the lines. Let's pray and invite the Holy Spirit to be here with us. <clears throat> Holy Spirit, we are just so honored by your presence and Jesus, we thank you for all that you've done for us and in our life, God. There's so many things to be grateful for. And Jesus, we just wanna, we wanna know you. We wanna know you more. Holy Spirit, I ask that you would reveal to us who Jesus is tonight. Let it be more than just good songs, good music, a good message. Let it be, let it be the presence of the person of Jesus that comes in and completely transforms our life. Holy Spirit, would you bring in the spirit of wisdom and revelation that we can see you in a new way, that we will be changed forever. In your name I pray. Everyone said? Amen. Amen. So for the next few minutes, I want to talk to you about three things, um, three different areas that we can step outside of the line in our Christian faith. Hopefully it'll help you. The first thing we're going to talk about is expectations. Everybody say expectations. Y'all, I'm so excited about this one. This is cool. I feel like as a Christian, if you can start expecting things, like expecting God to actually do things in your life, you'll be able to see some really cool things in your life. I'm really pumped for this. Do you have your Bible with me? Wave your Bible if you have your, your paper Bible with me. Let's go. Bonus points. I love my paper Bibles. Let's turn those paper Bibles to John chapter 2. We're going to look at John chapter 2. And we're going to look at verses 1 through 5. This is the story of the very first miracle that Jesus ever did in, recorded in the Bible. And um, in John chapter 2, verse 1, it says this, On the third day there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Now both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding, and when they ran out of wine, the mother of Jesus said to Jesus, They have no wine. Now this, take note about this next verse. This is crazy. Jesus said to her, Woman! What does your concern have to do with me? Now, let me just say this. I can imagine myself saying this to my mom. It would not go over well. Hey, Dominic, I need you to clean your room. We have guests coming over. Woman, what, what does your guests have to do? Yeah, I would be six feet under the ground right now. That would be crazy. And I'm sure, I'm sure it would be, you know, we might have lost something in translation here. But, but uh, Jesus says, woman, what does your concern have to do with me? He's basically saying this. Mom, it's not my fault that they ran out of wine. I am not catering this wedding. They didn't prepare accordingly. This is not my fault that they ran out of wine. How many know this? That Jesus came to this earth to do more than keep your party going. This was so outside of the purpose of Jesus. The Son of God took on flesh so he can die on the cross and forgive all of humanity for their sins. And his mom's asking him to make more wine for their party. Like, how degrading is this, right? Like, come on, Mom, really? I'm the Son of God, and you're asking me to just make more wine. Come on. He says, my hour has not yet come. In verse 5, his mother said to the servants, whatever he says to you, do it. Like, if you're Jesus, I would look back and say, Mom, what part of that did you think that I was agreeing to make more wine? Like, where did you get yes in the sentence I just told you? Because when I read that, it is very clear that Jesus does not want to make wine for this wedding. He says, woman, this doesn't concern me. He says, my hour is not here. And his mom said, hey, guys, just whatever he says, just do it. <laughs> what? Here's what I gather from this, this story, that if Mary's faith wasn't full of expectation, Jesus' first miracle wouldn't have been turning water into wine. If Mary wasn't filled with expectation and perseverance, maybe Jesus' first miracle wasn't turning water into wine. Maybe this doesn't happen if Mary goes, you're right, okay, I'm just going to sit back. Maybe this, this, doesn't have, this miracle doesn't take place if, if Mary didn't expect something from Jesus. And this is what I want to ask us today, and this is what I want to think, us to think about. When you wake up in the morning, what do your expectations look like from God? When you walk through these doors, like when you came here tonight, what were you expecting to get when you got here? Were you expecting to see some of your friends, say hi? Here's, here's some great worship music, hear a good message, or were you expecting to meet 
the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Like, as Christians, a lot of times, our expectations begin and end with hoping bad things don't happen in our life. It's like, oh man, I forgot to get gas last night. My car's on E. I really hope that I can make it to work. And that's like what we expect God to do. God, get my car to work. It's like, really, that, you're going to leave your house and that's going to be what you want the King of Kings and Lord of Lords to do in your life. Like as Christians, if we can begin to believe and expect more from God, this is what I think, I think that he will be, begin to do more in our life. Just as his mother Mary said, hey, listen, guys, just do whatever he said. She had an expectation of Jesus that Jesus honestly didn't even want to fill, but it was in response to the faith that Mary had where Jesus said, okay, I'm going to fill that desire. And a lot of us, we don't have any desires for Jesus to fill. We don't ask him to do anything. We don't expect him to do anything in our life. And as a result, nothing happens. And we're like, oh my goodness. Man, what does the Bible say in Ephesians chapter 3? I believe it's verse 20. He says, to him who is able to do above all that we can ask, think, or imagine. Right? But we don't ask, think, or imagine anything. And so Jesus doesn't have a lot to work with to exceed our expectations. (laughs) Our expectations are at zero. So Jesus is like, this is easy. I don't have to do anything. Right? But as Christians, if we were to get up, like Sunday when we come in here, man, let let us walk into this room saying this, Jesus, I expect the kingdom of heaven to fill this room. I expect in 20 years to look back and say, man, July 17th, 2022, that was the Sunday that changed my life forever. That was the Sunday where I showed up to church, God showed up to church, and man, the the entire city of Lorraine was different. Why? Because I expect God to move. I expect him to do something. I expect my life to be filled with the goodness of God. When I go to the grocery store, I'm not just going to buy eggs. I'm expecting a divine encounter from heaven to happen on my way. I expect next time I open the mailbox, there not just to be bills in there. Come on, right? Like, you, you have to expect the goodness of God in your life. You have to adjust the way you think, the way that you approach your faith. You know, there's a, there's a story in the Bible that I love. It's such a great story, but it's, it's the Samaritan woman who her daughter is sick. She comes to Jesus and she says, Jesus, can you heal my daughter? And Jesus basically kind of dogs her out. He says, listen, woman, I'm, I haven't been sent but to the children of Israel, I can't give the the children's bread to the dogs. And at that point, 99% of us in this room would have done this. Okay, Jesus. Because we don't expect anything more. But what did that woman do? She said, Jesus, listen. Even the dogs get a little bit of crumbs. And in that moment of expectation, in that moment of stepping out of the line where everyone else would have turned back, everyone else would have given up, she steps out of line and she says, no, Jesus, my expectation is that you heal my daughter. And Jesus says, wow, what great faith. I've never even seen this in all of Israel. And her daughter's healed. Come on, church, we've got to start believing. We've got to start expecting. We've got to start stepping out in faith and really pursuing the goodness of God in our life. On the opposite side of that coin, there's another story in the Bible of a young man. He is a rich, young ruler. Remember this story? And he comes to Jesus and he says, what, what can I do to inherit eternal life? And he, he, he essentially asks Jesus if, Jesus if he can follow him. And, and Jesus says, listen, you can follow me. This is what I need you to do. I need you to go sell everything and come with me. And this young guy looked at all of his possessions and then looked at What he didn't have is faith and expectation, and he said, man, I can't give this up. But only if he would have had a little bit of faith, only if he would have expected something from Jesus, like only if he would have said, you know what, I might have to give this up, but there's something attached to this man, Jesus, that is so much better than what I have. I'll give everything away just to have him, but he didn't. He didn't. And there's so many Christians that lack that same faith. There's so many of us that don't have the faith required to step out of line, to reach forward with our expectation and say, man, I have the opportunity to walk with the Son of God, but it's too expensive. It's too much. Church, what are you expecting when you leave your house? Come on, how many want to see 
God move in ways that we've never seen him move before. Do you want to see him move? I want to see him move. I am tired of praying prayers that don't get answered. I'm tired walking around with weak faith, hoping that God hears my prayers. No, I am, I am ready to live my life expecting God to do the miraculous. I want to be shocked when people don't get healed. <laughs> I want it to be a shock when they don't receive Jesus, right? Why? Because that's what I expect. That's what you should expect. You should expect every encounter with somebody, every time we come to church, for the King of Kings to show up and transform everything. It's our expectations. We have to step out of line in our expectations. Here's the second thing I want to talk to you about. Opportunity. Everybody say opportunity. Opportunity. This one's cool, too. This is, I think, where a lot of Christians miss miss out on. But here's a really cool story, one of my favorite stories in the Bible, Mark chapter 5, if you have your Bible. Mark chapter 5, we're going to read the story of the woman with issue of blood. We all know this story. In uh, Mark chapter 5, verse 25, the Bible says, now a certain woman had a flow of blood for 12 years and had suffered many things from many physicians. She had spent all that she had and was no better, but rather grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. Verse 28 says, For she said, If only I may touch his clothes, I shall be made well. What incredible faith this woman had. And I want to kind of take a step back. Let's put ourselves in her shoes and in the time that she lived in, right? She, she, obviously heard of Jesus. She knew who he was, and she probably heard stories of what Jesus did, or maybe even she even saw Jesus one day as he's walking down the street, walk over to a blind man, spit in the ground, put some mud on his eyes, and the blind man was healed. Maybe she witnessed that, or maybe she heard about the time where Jesus was walking in this big crowd, and, and he saw Zacchaeus up in a tree, and, and she witnessed the moment where Jesus' eyes scanned everyone And stopped on this one little dude that was hanging out in a tree. And he said, Zacchaeus, I want to come to your house. Maybe she heard about Lazarus and Jesus went to the tomb and said, Lazarus, come forth. And and all of these encounters and experiences where Jesus came and touched people, she heard about. She knew about the power that this man had. And one of the coolest things about this woman is that Jesus was not there for her. If you read in the chapter, Jesus is actually on his way to heal somebody else. He's actually traveling to single out somebody else, this little girl, to heal her. And it's not her turn at that time. It's not her moment. The pastor didn't single her out. The prophet didn't prophesy over her. She was looked over. In fact, Jesus, after he, she got healed, he didn't even know who it was that touched him. She was completely overlooked. And she said this, I'm not waiting until Jesus comes and touches me. I gotta go touch him. I can't sit here. I can't sit back and just hope and pray that Jesus sees me as he walks by and then maybe he'll come up and and lay hands on me. I can't wait any longer. I've tried everything else. I am gonna go find Jesus and I'm going to touch him. This is the opportunity of faith that many Christians don't take advantage of. This is the opportunity of faith that that we miss out on so many times because we sit around waiting for Jesus to come touch us. We sit around saying, man, Jesus, if you would just come and, you know, just fix this situation, if you could come and do this in my life, if you could just come and, like, be with me. Listen, you have the opportunity to go find Jesus. You don't have to wait until Jesus finds you. You can decide in your home on a Friday night that you want to be in the presence of Jesus and you can just step into it. (laughs) You don't have to sit around and wait for Jesus to like magically fix your life. You can find him and touch him. I remember when I was a kid, this was, I had to be so young. I was probably like nine or 10, but I remember like, Really, when I first began to understand things about the Lord, like I understood kind of what, who the Lord was and, and his role in our life. And, and I remember I was sitting there playing my, my PlayStation, PlayStation, I think it was PlayStation 2, or it might have been the original one, I don't know. But I was playing PlayStation, and I said, you know what? I put my controller down, and I climbed up on my bunk bed, and I sat there, and I said, Jesus, if you're real, I want to I experience you. I want to find you. 
And I remember having this conversation with the Lord. This is the first time I've ever experienced the Lord's presence in my life. And I'm not joking. ever had with the Lord. All I remember as a kid was literally laying in my bed, bawling my eyes out, crying because the presence of the Lord was so thick in my, in my bunk bed. <laughs> it was. It was crazy. It was the first time I ever experienced the Lord, but all it took was me going to find Jesus. Jesus didn't interrupt my video game. He didn't interrupt me when I was playing, you know, Mario Kart. I set my Mario Kart down and I went and found him. And church, this is the opportunity that you have. You don't have to to just sit around and wait. You don't have to like just allow the enemy to beat you up. You can get up and go find Jesus. You can get up just like this woman said and say, man, if I can just touch him, if I can just touch the person of Jesus. Come on, church. This is the faith that you and I have to have. We can't go through life not understanding and not knowing this truth. This woman was not going to wait for Jesus. She was going to find him. So what I want to ask you, church, what times in your life do you find Jesus? Do you look for him? Do you search for him? Or do you just wait around until he interrupts you? Do you purposefully, everywhere you go, in every interaction, say, man, Jesus, I want to find you. Where are you? You know, I love, I love what John said. And I think it's John chapter, it's in John chapter 1, I think it's like verse 20-something or 29, I think it is, but it's when John the Baptist is baptizing all the people, and, and he's just kind of looking around, and you know, he's just baptizing people, and then all of a sudden, something happens, something shifts, and he says, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He finds Jesus in the crowd, in the midst of the crowd, and in that one moment, he, he treated Jesus differently than he treated everyone else. He said, no, no, you're, this is Jesus. This is the Lamb of God. Church, can you find Jesus that way? Oh, man, Jesus, there you are. You're in that person right there. You're in this situation right there, Jesus. I found you. You're right there. Come on, church, we've got to take the opportunity to look for him. Here's the last thing that I want to talk to you about. Responsibility. Everyone say responsibility. Responsibility. This is such a cool story, and I'm really excited about this. Um, I want to read this story that really we don't know much about this man, but it's in Mark chapter 15. If you have your Bible, let's go to Mark chapter 15. Um, this is the story of a man named Simon. He was, he was uh, from Cyrene. You remember this story where he actually carried the cross of Jesus? This is a really, really interesting story, and this is basically all we know about this man named Simon. But in verse uh, 21, the Bible says, then they compelled, everyone say compelled, um, another translation, I think it's in Luke, the Bible says they seized. This word is basically telling us that they force, they used force to make Simon do this. Simon didn't volunteer to carry the cross. They compelled him. They forced him to carry the cross. But it says they compelled a certain man, Simon, a Cyrenian, the father of Alexander and Rufus, as he was coming out of the country and passing by to bear his cross. And, that, and, and they they brought him to the place Golgotha, which is translated the place of, this, of a skull. So this is really interesting. So Simon is not from Jerusalem. He's from Cyrene. Cyrene is in northern Africa. And so, so Simon was a Jew. And a lot of times, obviously, what happens at the Passover is Jews from all over, that pla- all over the world at that time would come back to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. And so Simon isn't from around town. And it, the Bible tells us he's just passing by. So there's a good chance that before Simon got to Jerusalem, they, he never heard of who Jesus was. He was from Cyrene, really far away. They didn't have Twitter. You know, there was no Facebook viral videos of Jesus healing people going around. Like, he didn't know who this man Jesus was. And, and it's probably safe to assume that as he came into Jerusalem, he heard stories about this, this dude that was walking around healing people, this guy that was raising the dead, right? But he didn't know who Jesus was. He didn't know that this was, you know, the son of God. I'm sure he heard a lot of different things, but Simon was like somebody who's coming in from the outside, right? It's really important for us to know that. And the Bible tells us that he was forced to carry the cross of Jesus, that he wasn't sitting on the sidelines like, oh, let me do it, let me do it. I want to carry the cross of Jesus. This is the son of God. I want to I bear his cross, right? Because that's what we think we would have done if we were there. Like, oh, Jesus, what an honor to bear your cross. Come on, let's go. 
But he was like, no, dude, I'm not carrying that dude's cross. Like, what? And then the soldier's like, yeah, you're going to carry the cross. And he's like, okay, I'll carry the cross. Right? He was forced into this. And Simon's life was interrupted, and he was given the opportunity to bear the burden of Christ. Like, I want us to really understand and, and look at what happened in this man's life. Like, he could have been on the way to the market. He could have been on the way to his friend's house. He could have just been hanging outside of his house, the place he was staying, and saw this crowd forming and just kind of walked in the crowd. And all of a sudden, as this man was going through his normal everyday life, he had the most incredible opportunity that any human could have in that moment. He bore the cross of Jesus and carried the the burden of, of Christ. Like imagine your life being completely interrupted and you bearing the cross of Jesus. Now the story gets even more interesting because from some point, at some point between that moment where he was forced to carry the cross and later in his life, we can assume that he was transformed by this experience and he gave his life to Jesus. And here's why we can assume that because his sons, if you go back to that scripture verse, I think it's Alexander and Rufus, a lot of theologians believe that Alexander and Rufus later became leaders of the church at Rome because Paul, when he writes the book of Romans and he writes a letter to Rome, mentions an Alexander and Rufus in his kind of like farewells, right? And so a lot of theologians think that it's the same two sons of this man named Simon who later become church leaders, which tells me this, that Simon was so impacted by Jesus, this man that he didn't even know, this man that... He bore his cross for, who was forced to carry the cross, was so impacted that he later tells his sons about it. And his sons become believers. And more than believers, they become church leaders. And at some point, you can think that Simon sitting back, as he's an old man, looking back at what was an opportunity that he was forced into, being the greatest moment of his life. Could you imagine him being able to tell that story to, like, his grandkids or or whatever the case is, is you're older in life and you're like, man, guys, I was, just, I was just walking around and the soldiers made me pick up this cross and it was Jesus. I got to bear the cross for Jesus. I got to put his cross on my back and, and walk with him down to the place where he would get crucified. What an incredible honor and what would be Something that he was forced into would become probably the greatest honor of his entire life. This is an opportunity that I believe every single one of us Christians get in our life. At some point or another, we get this opportunity to bear the cross of Jesus, to bear the burden of Jesus. And here's what I mean by this. You have a responsibility, and it's not one Unlike Simon, like no one's going to force you to to put it on your back, but we have the responsibility to pick up the cross, the burden of Jesus, and carry out that burden. This is what I believe. A lot of Christians, we live our life, we live our life as if Jesus owes us something. We live our life as if Jesus, you know, Jesus, you you, you owe me all of these things. Like we, we feel no, we feel no responsibility in this relationship with him, but we think that Jesus is here to serve us, but it's quite the contrary to that, that we are here, we exist to serve him. We exist to fill the desires of Jesus' heart. Like, what would it look like for a believer to dedicate his or her life to fulfilling the desires that are on Jesus' heart? Like, what would that look like? That's such an incredible thing to be able to do where I can give my life to serve him. Like, a lot of times as Christians, we think that Jesus needs to make our life great. Like, Jesus, you need to fix my life so it's good and I'm happy. But that's not what Jesus says. He says, listen, if you want to be great, this is what you need to do. You need to get down on your knees like I did and begin to wash the feet of those around you. Jesus says greatness doesn't look like being the smartest or being the best. It looks like being a servant. It looks like serving those around you. And a lot of times we just use this as ways to recruit our volunteers, hey guys, like we need volunteers. Jesus said to serve, so join our volunteer team. But what if it's deeper than that? What if you and I have the opportunity to serve, create a life that is dedicated to serving Jesus? Yes, we serve one another, but man, Jesus, what are your desires? I exist to serve you. I exist to fill your desires. 
man, this is the opportunity that Simon had and that completely transformed his life. And this is the responsibility that as Christians, it comes to every single one of us at one point or another. It comes to every single one of us. Like, I believe that in this room, God has called men and women to be intercessors, like for real intercessors. I'm not just talking about praying good prayers over your steak dinner. I'm talking about you're connecting with the heart of God and you're interceding and praying the heart of the Father in this region. Like there are men or women in this room who are called to worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords in the same way that the angels and the elders worship him. 24-7 they see holy, holy, holy. Like there are those in this room who are called to be in the presence of the Lord like that. Like this is, this is who we are, church. We have the responsibility to serve Jesus. As everybody else in society is telling us that Jesus is here to serve us, it's time for you and I to step out of that line. We're done with that. Like, here's my, like, if Jesus doesn't do anything else for you, is he still worth your life? Like, if he doesn't heal you, if he doesn't, like, do things for you, if you don't, if he doesn't, like, you know, answer all the prayers, is he still worth you and I saying, Jesus, I still want to commit my entire life to serving you? to worshiping you, to honoring you. It's our responsibility, church. It's what we're called to do. Amen? Simon's life was interrupted, and he was given the opportunity to bear the burden of Christ. Completely interrupted. Let that be our prayer tonight. Jesus, will you interrupt our life? Will you interrupt us and give us the opportunity to serve you? Something that might feel intimidating. Like, here, here's what I, I just hear the Holy Spirit saying this now, that, that that opportunity has come to some people in this room and you've not taken it because you're scared. Because you're intimidated. Because you don't think you can, you can, you can do it. And I can imagine Simon being a little scared, a little frightened. That's a big piece of wood. I don't know if I can carry that. I don't know if I can do it, Jesus. Don't think of it as a, oh my goodness, I don't want to do that. Think of it as, this is, this is an honor. This is a privilege. You get to serve the King of kings and the Lord of lords. This is our responsibility. This is our honor. This is our privilege to do. Come on, church, stand with me as we close here tonight. Here's the idea. There are no boundaries to your faith. Sometimes God will take you beyond the lines. Holy Spirit, we just ask you right now in this moment that you would that you would interrupt our life, interrupt us, interrupt our, our normal day-to-day life. Maybe we've become, maybe we've gotten in too much of a routine with our faith where we just, we just go through the motions, God. We just go to church and we read our Bible and we do these things and we're going through the motions. And Holy Spirit, I ask that you would completely interrupt us right now interrupt us the way Simon was interrupted on his way to the market or his friend's house. His life was completely changed and he was given the opportunity to serve Jesus. Would you interrupt our selfish life right now and show us how we can give our life to the king, give everything we have to him, commit to serving him, to honoring him, to loving him. We wanna be great, God. We don't want to be great in terms of the world's definition of greatness. We want to be great because we love you, Jesus, and we serve you, and we serve your bride, and we we give our life to prayer. We give our life to worship. We give our life to intimacy with you, Jesus, knowing that no time, no second, no minute, no hour is wasted in your presence, Jesus. I feel like tonight there are some, you know, I was out in Valley View last week and we preached this message out there and man, the Holy Spirit was saying this so clear and I, and I feel the same, I feel the same here tonight that, that there are gifts and mantles and burdens, whatever you want to call them, available 
tonight. Like, here's what I mean by that. Like, there, there are some things that God has given you, he's gifted you with, he's placed on you, he's asked you to do, right? Those are awesome, and, and we know what those are, a lot of us, and we know kind of what God's laid on our life. But there are, there are more things that you and I can pick up tonight. Like, the same way Elisha picked up the mantle of Elijah, just picked it up, I feel like there are, there are opportunities tonight for you to serve Jesus in ways that you've never been gifted to serve him in before. Like I remember, just for kind of a reference, I remember my dad, he was sitting probably over there somewhere years ago, and I remember the story of this big name speaker coming in here and like prophesying over my dad and saying that he would do this and be this. And, you know, unfortunately, he never got to fulfill those things. But the cool thing is that I picked those up. My brother has picked those up. And there's people in this room who maybe you come from a family where, where it was prophesied over your dad, your grandma, your, your, your great grandparents that they would this or they would do this or be this and, and they haven't and you're disappointed. Don't be disappointed, pick it up. Just pick it up, you do it. God's promises don't begin and end with us. Don't get it twisted. When I go to the grave, God's promises don't come to the grave with me right? Like they're generational. They're from everlasting to everlasting. And so here's the reality is that we have now the opportunity to pick up the things that God has for us and for other people. I just feel like it's like, it's like a clearance sale. I feel like we're in the season of a clearance sale. Like God's saying like, what do you want? Like not in a way of greed saying like, give me this, but it's like, God, I want to serve you. Like, I want, I want to give my life to fill your desires. And God's like, how do you want to do it? And you're like, this is what I want to do for you, Jesus. And he's just giving away these gifts, these burdens, these anointings. Like, I feel like a lot of people recently are getting the burden for prayer. That's just been on my heart for like a couple months now. I feel like there's people in our church specifically who are beginning to feel the burden to pray more. And you might be like, oh man, I'm not an intercessor. I don't even know how to pray. I don't either, but the idea is is that we give our life to that. We give all of our time to that. And you might have been a Christian for 30 years and never been an intercessor. When you leave this room, you're gonna be an intercessor. <laughs> like, like, that's what I feel like God's doing. Like, he's giving you new gifts. He's giving you new things. And you might have never known that you have this, but you're walking out with the burden. The same way Simon, he was just walking through the streets. He didn't have a cross on his back when he was walking through the streets and all of a sudden he had a cross on his back. Like all of a sudden, you're gonna have a cross on your back and it's gonna be the greatest opportunity of your life. It's gonna be the greatest opportunity of my life. So Holy Spirit, we just respond to to your word tonight and we say yes, we accept it, Jesus. We We want the burden of Christ. We want to bear these these burdens, God, these gifts, these anointings, this, this mantle, Father, to serve you. However, however we can, God, would you give us the burden to serve you tonight? That we would give our life to just love on you, Jesus. That we would give our life to serve you, to fill your desires. That we would be men and women not caught up in fame and success that this world is, is identifies with, but we would be men and women who give our life in service to give our life waste every moment of our life on you Jesus to fill your desires thank you Jesus that no time with you is time that's wasted no time in your presence is time that's wasted Jesus that every moment with you Jesus is is specifically designed to change the fabric of reality. That our prayers, God, through intercession, it's it's establishing your kingdom here in this world. Pray that you would raise up intercessors tonight. Raise up people who are burdened for prayer, that are consumed with prayer, God. Who give their their days, their hours to prayer, Father God, and and maybe even not even saying anything, but just 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 being in your presence and feeling your heart, God. God, with all of the division and all of the the attacks that are going on towards your bride, would you raise up people that cover your church in prayer? Not divide your church through arguments and ideologies, but cover your bride in prayer in this moment. 
Jesus, we love you. Would you teach us how to have greater expectation? Would you teach us how to expect incredible things in our life from you, Jesus? Everywhere we go, God, we expect your, your goodness to go before us and behind us. Just like Peter healed those with his shadow, we just expect, God, we expect your power to move in our life. We expect your goodness to be manifest in our life. Not to make us great, but to show the world how good you are, God. Jesus, would you help us to take every opportunity to find you? Every opportunity to find you. We love you tonight. In your name I pray. Everyone said, amen, amen. Here's what I want to do. Before we dismiss and I let you guys go tonight, there's a couple of things I want to do. If we have any altar ministers that are here, if you guys can maybe come around to the front. And, and man, I, I just truly believe that, you know, our altar, our people that pray for individuals, like these are great people, great men and women. I know them all. And the cool thing is, is that this isn't just like a, hey, we want to give you a hug and then send you on your way. Like I came here tonight expecting God to do miracles. I came here tonight expecting the kingdom of heaven to be established in this region in your life, in my life. And if you need a move of God, if you're saying, listen, I, I need to find Jesus. Listen, I need, I need this in my life. We wanna pray with you. We wanna believe it. We want you to walk out healed. We want your family member to, to be healed right now in this moment. If you're here and you don't know Jesus, if you've never given your life to him, or maybe you have and you've gone away from it, or whatever the case is, if you're watching online, this is what I wanna ask. If every head can be bowed, every eye closed, if you're here tonight and say, you know what? I want to give my life to Jesus. I want to go all in. I want to give my life to serve him. On the count of three, just lift your hand up so I can see it. One, two, three. Everybody in the room? Cool, I see that. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Online, if you're watching, let's pray this prayer together. Jesus, come on, nice and loud. Jesus, I give my life to you. Would you come into my heart? Would you be the Lord of my life and forgive me of my sins? Holy Spirit, lead me, guide me, show me Jesus. In your name I pray, amen, amen. Hey church, it's been an honor and a privilege to be with you tonight. And if you need any prayer at all, please come this way before you go that way. If you're online, you can just comment your prayer request. We're gonna be praying for you as well. Remember to live right, love everyone, and pray hard. Let's serve Jesus, church, come on, amen. Let's serve his heart. Love you all. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy.